It is hard to turn on the news and not see some type of report that involves unmanned aircraft. Regardless of what they are called, unmanned aircraft, UAs, remotely piloted aircraft, RPAs, drones, or unoccupied aerial vehicles, they are here to stay. For this course, unmanned aerial vehicle or UAVs will be used to designate an aerial vehicle that does not include an internal pilot for control. In this section, we are going to explore the history of UAVs. It is not important to memorize the names and dates during the development, but understand the reasons for unmanned aircraft and the innovations that they have made them possible. By understanding the past, we will have a better understanding of their future roles. Let's take a quick look at the history of unmanned aircraft. The earliest recorded use of an unmanned aerial vehicle for war was in 1849, when the Austrians attacked the Italian city of Venice with unmanned balloons loaded with bombs. Once positioned over the town, they were dropped electrically using a long copper wire attached to a large battery. The bomb then fell and exploded on contact with the ground. Although some of the balloons worked and successfully managed to bomb Venice, others were caught by a change of the wind and were blown back over Austrian lines. In Madison Square Garden, at the Electrical Exhibition of 1898, Tesla demonstrated a radio-controlled boat. Tesla's boat used several large batteries for power and radio signals control the vessel. This is the first recorded instance where radio signals were used to control a vehicle. World War I started when Archduke Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated on June 28, 1914. It wasn't long before manned aircraft were used by both sides in combat. Early aircraft were typically unarmed and used in reconnaissance role until personal weapons were added. A machine gun was finally fixed to these aircraft to create what we know today as the fighter aircraft. World War I fighter pilots had a typical life expectancy of several weeks while flying in combat. In terms of flying hours, a combat pilot could count on 40 to 60 hours before being killed, at least in the early part of the war. The British attempted to develop an unmanned aircraft in response to the attrition rate of fighter pilots. The aerial target was a radio-controlled, unmanned airplane conceived in late 1916. It was designed for both defense against zeppelins where it could be controlled from the ground and as a flying bomb for which it could be controlled from an accompanying manned aircraft. None of the six aircraft built were able to get airborne and interest in the program faded. The United States also became interested in unmanned aircraft. In 1916 the U.S. Navy awarded the Sperry Gyroscope Company $200,000 to construct a self-guided aerial torpedo. In 1917, Charles Kettering was directing the U.S. Army's own aerial torpedo project. Kettering wanted to build a simpler and cheaper torpedo than the Sperry Brothers version. Kettering aerial torpedoes cost approximately $400 per aircraft and because of its design was nicknamed the Bug. Initial testing in 1918 didn't go well, but changes to the aircraft produced a more reliable system. World War I ended in November of 1918 and the military lost interest in the project. A link to the YouTube video of some of the early test flights is included in the learning activities section. I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the dates highlighted on the timeline. In 1923, the first recorded gathering of model aircraft enthusiasts took place in St. Louis, Missouri. Thirteen years later, in 1936, the American Academy of Model Aeronautics was formed, what is now known as the Academy of Model Aeronautics or AMA, is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to promote the development of model aviation as a recognized sport and worthwhile recreational activity. Later on, when we discuss the 2012 FAA Reauthorization Act, there is language in the legislation that directs the FAA to adopt community-based organizational guidelines. While the bill doesn't specifically mention the AMA by name, the organization represents 195,000 members throughout the country. What is interesting is that the AMA was formed two years prior to Congress establishing the Civil Aeronautics Administration, which later became the Federal Aviation Administration. In September 1939, Germany invades Poland and World War II begins. Once again, manned aircraft played an important part on both sides of the conflict. While the United States remained neutral in the early years of the war, it did realize that it wasn't prepared if it did need to enter the war. In order to train pilots and gunners for aerial combat, the United States needed an aerial target for them to practice on. 
The OQ-2 radio plane was the first mass-produced UAV or drone in the United States. A follow-on version, the OQ-3, became the most widely used target aircraft in U.S. service, with over 9,400 being built during World War II. The OQ-2 was a simple aircraft, powered by a two-cylinder, two-cycle piston engine, providing six horsepower, and driving two counter-rotating propellers. Launching was by catapult only and recovered by parachute should the aircraft survive the target practice. Both sides also developed various unmanned aircraft. The Germans developed the V-1 Pulse Jet unmanned aircraft and the V-2 rockets to use against England. The V-1 was basically a point-and-shoot weapon and used an internal guidance system to keep it flying in a straight line towards its target. An odometer driven by a small propeller on the nose determined when the target area had been reached. It was accurate enough for area bombing. Before launch, the counter was set to a value that would reach zero upon arrival at the target in the prevailing wind conditions. One of the weaknesses with this system is that it required a launch ramp to point it at its target. The launch ramps were easy to identify and bomb from the air. Also, V-1s were slow and were often shot down by anti-aircraft guns and fighter aircraft. A video with more details about Germany's V-1 program is included in the Learning Activities section. The Japanese fire balloon was the first ever weapon possessing intercontinental range. Taking advantage of the jet stream, the Japanese launched over 9,300 balloons from 1944 until the end of the war in 1945. Of the 9,300 balloons launched, only 300 were found or observed in the United States. The balloons carried various payloads of anti-personnel and incendiary bombs. The balloons were intended to instill fear and terror in the U.S. The bombs were relatively ineffective as weapons of destruction, resulting in only six deaths from one incident. A link to a YouTube video with more information on the Japanese balloon bombs is located in the Learning Activities section. The United States also used unmanned aircraft, codenamed Operation Aphrodite, to deliver explosives to targets. Employing a different approach to the Germans' B-1 and the Japanese balloon bombs, the U.S. used worn-out bombers packed with explosives. The main difference between the system is that the U.S. bombers were radio-controlled from another aircraft which guided them to their target, making them more of a precision weapon than the B-1s and the balloon bombs. A link to the YouTube video with more information on Af Operation Aphrodite is located in the Learning Activities section. Tensions in the world still continued after World War II, and in 1947, the Cold War with the Soviet Union began. In 1956, the CAA becomes the Federal Aviation Administration, also known as the FAA. One of the responsibilities of the FAA is to regulate the national airspace system. You will hear the national airspace system also referred to as the NAS. Without going into the history of the Cold War, it would be safe to say that there was a mutual distrust and paranoia between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union became a closed society, and it was difficult for the United States and our allies to gather intelligence on the Soviet military capabilities. In 1952, the U.S. started using manned aircraft to conduct intelligence gathering overflights of the Soviet Union. On July 4, 1956, the first U-2 flight over the Soviet Union took place. The U-2 flights were successful in that they could fly higher than the Soviet anti-aircraft defenses could reach. On April 28, 1960, a U.S. Lockheed U-2 spy plane was shot down by the Soviets using a modified surface-to-air missile. This event ended the manned intelligence overflights of the Soviet Union. Unable to safely send manned intelligence flights over hostile territories, the United States turned to unmanned aircraft and space-based systems. The U.S. used the Lockheed D-21 reconnaissance drone to fill the void. Four operational missions with the D-21 took place. The flights were conducted over the People's Republic of China from November 1969 to March 1971 to spy on the Lopnor nuclear test site. The program was canceled shortly after the four flights, primarily due to issues with recovering the payload. We will look at the FAA's Advisory Circular 9157, Model Aircraft Operating Standards, later when we discuss regulatory issues. The one takeaway is to notice that Advisory Circular 9157 was first published in 1981 and provided guidelines to the hobbyist community on model aircraft operations.
During the Vietnam conflict, the U.S. Army needed a small battlefield drone that could act as a target designator. One of the systems to emerge from this need was the Lockheed Aquila. The first flight of the Aquila occurred in 1983. The program was plagued by numerous development issues and it was canceled in 1987 after $1 billion was spent on the program. A link to a YouTube video with more information on the Aquila is located in the Learning Activities section. Usually when you mention the word drone, the first aircraft that the public will think of is the MQ-1 Predator. The Predator first flew in 1995 and its variant, the MQ-9 Reaper, are still in service today with the U.S. military and U.S. Border Patrol. Lama became the first civil unmanned aircraft to cross the North Atlantic. The crossing was completed within 15 minutes of the scheduled arrival time after flying 2,044 miles in 26 hours and 45 minutes. This flight demonstrates the potential for civil unmanned aircraft to operate in remote locations beyond the light of sight of their operators. A link to a YouTube video with more information about the Lima flight is located in the learning section. We will be discussing many of these events in later units, so I'll let you pause the video and take a look at them. One thing to keep in mind when reviewing these events is when a portable civil unmanned aircraft system became available to the public. No one has come up with an exact date, but somewhere around 2010, small consumer model aircraft became affordable and popular with the public. Shortly after that, Congress directed the FAA to integrate small unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. 